So again, I think uh, Bordeaux gives us a lot of kind of practical and, and is, is quite a, a check on kind of our, um, how we utilize participant observation and not just focus on ritual, but, but focus on kind of the small stuff in life too. Um, Postmodernism is going to come out of the idea. It's it's a rejection of kind of this objective uh, view of anthropology. Intersubjective to a certain degree is is working um, into a little bit of postmodernism. Um, Renato Rosaldo is one of the kind of leaders of the postmodern movement in terms of anthropology. Um, and really what it is, it challenged the rationalism and scientific neutrality of the period of 1920 to 1970. This whole idea that you can get to objective facts about human beings. They're going to reject all that and they really get into human hermeneutics, uh, which is the study of interpretation of meaning. Um, like real meaning doesn't necessarily exist. So we're going to study how people interpret it. And again, inner subjective gets into that as well. Non-scientific telling a narrative acknowledged, uh, acknowledging bias is the key here. A lot of postmodernists. Um, have, have kind of been trained in anthropology, but have turned themselves more into literary masters and, and the master of, of uh, experiencing indigenous life through narrative. Um, they, wrote, they write more novel style books, like that autoethnography um, would be one of those um, styles in terms of being very postmodernist and um, acknowledging bias, you know, but also telling your narrative story. So autoethnography fits into this postmodernism idea as well. But, but really, when it first came out in the 1970s, it really just kind of rejects anthropology's past as kind of being this colonial idea that you can still study people in this scientific way. Um, and really turns it into this dialectic process where there's a conversation to be had, um, which is important. Um, so did postmodernism need to, to come along to kind of critique what had been um, explained as truth and uh, ob objective data, probably. Now what we have is kind of a blend where people are, are able to use postmodernist narrative into kind of the, the realized um, intersubjective kind of move towards objective. So it's a lot of people are not sitting in, in one of these two camps like they were um, in the past, and especially the 80s and 90s, it kind of confused the heck out of the field. Um, it's more that people are are merging them kind of all as one in terms of this is what anthropology looks like now, and people kind of take what they want in terms of theories and, and apply them here and there. Um, I think this is the last slide. Uh, activists in, in anarchist anthropology is, is a fascinating uh, subtopic. Um, the word anarchist to a lot of Americans, again, is going to be um, this, this kind of idea that uh, that has been put into our brains because of really the assassination of, of a couple um, uh, politicians in American history. The, the one that comes to mind is um, William McKinley in 1901, was shot by Leon Solbos, who, who basically claimed to be an anarchist. After that point, uh, anarchists who actually don't believe in, in destroying the government or blowing them up, that's terrorism, um, get co-opted into this group of, of terrorists. And it's it's unfortunate um, because at least to David Graeber and some of these other anthropologists, anarchy is more of a return to how we used to live and kind of ban tribal societies. All anarchy to the true um, structure of anarchy means is that we should be capable of self-government. And that's what small level ban level groups did is, is they self-governed and they utilize direct democracy. Um, direct democracy, again, in California exists through the proposition or the initiative system. Um, I could bring forward a, a law, that I will, if I think something should be law, like bananas should only be sold on Sunday. Um, I could bring that up, and if it got enough signatures and passed through the normal processes, would be voted on by all of us. That's direct democracy. We make law as the citizens. Um, and this is how band level societies operated. If somebody wanted to move the camp upstream, it wasn't just there was a leader, because we're talking about egalitarian. There wasn't a leader. It was all of the adults in that group would come around and take a vote and have a discussion. And this is how they were operated. So this is kind of David Graeber's um, ideas in the current um, world, is that um, we should be moving back towards this, this self-government. Why did we move away from it? People took power, and then he really gets into power and economics and capitalism and stuff like that. 
two of the videos that I have assigned for the, the week are his videos. And I, I don't pick him because I claim to be an anarchist anthropologist. I understand what their, their perspective. Um, for me, it's like fun studying it as an anthropologist. Anthropology of anthropologist is, is kind of um, interesting. Um, he has some very, very interesting ideas and is probably the most famous anthropologist, cultural anthropologist on the planet currently. Um, Michael Tausig is, is also very famous, but he's older and he doesn't, he doesn't have kind of this edge that Graeber does. So um, when you're watching the videos, kind of pay attention to, to, to his ideas and, and, and what he kind of purports. It's very different from the initial shock that we get from his title. David Graeber also becomes a very big, important um, leader in the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, he, he is credited with, with uh, coining the term, we are the 99, which is the 99%, the 1% has all the wealth, all the, uh, the kind of Wall, Occupy Wall Street um, critiques. Um, so this is, this is a picture of David Graeber, two videos on him. You'll get exposed to him enough. Um, know that him being a leader of the Occupy Wall Street movement also thrusts him into this role of activist anthropology. Um, activist anthropology is a fascinating, again, teetering on whether or not you're going to be ethical in the field or not, right? So activist anthropologists sometimes could form a, be in the form of David Graeber, where he's, he's out doing direct action um, in the streets of New York by occupying Wall Street. Um, or it could be June Nash uh, leading kind of protest with the Mayan in Guatemala after the, the Civil War and, and genocide. Um, there's lots of activist anthropologists, and, and a lot of it has to do with um, anthropologists falling in love, like I was talking about earlier, with the culture and the people that they're studying. Um, again, if June Nash studied the, the Mayan in Guatemala, she's going to she's gonna form an affinity to that. And let's say that she comes back and she's teaching in the United States and the civil war and genocide starts breaking out. What do you do as an anthropologist? Do you just sit back and say, well, that's just the process? Well, I, I don't know that humanly, emotionally, um, that, that connectivity, the cooperative trust gene that we have in us doesn't allow us to just sit back and, and not do anything about that. So June Nash, you know, obviously is kind of part of this activist side, but is still an anthropologist and has done anthropology work with this, this, these groups of, of Maya um, in Guatemala. Um, again, I think that, that when I say teeters on ethical or unethical, we, we get into some of these issues of, it's probably not unethical to be an activist anthropologist if you're protesting and you have a sign. It might become unethical when you start throwing rocks and, and causing physical harm. We've now started to move into another level of activist, and I don't know that it has a place in ethical anthropological behavior. So again, a lot of um, kind of interesting gray area that starts to form. And and, and again, I think if, if going native is a term, you know, like when anthropologists no longer even want to go home or don't associate, they start to do the reverse uh, ethnocentricity where um, they, they have more of a bias towards their original culture than the new one, so they've gone totally native, and then they start to maybe act in, in violent ways to protect the group. Um, really, you started to you're you're moving out of anthropology and into becoming one of that group. You've lost your ethic perspective, um, and I think it's important and ethical to in the field to kind of let anthropologists or future anthropologists know that there's there's quite a, a difference in that in that kind of um, belief structure and basis and, and process really. Um, so that is a lot to take in. This class is a lot. Um, again, it's, it's moving in on the, you know, the, the 70 minute mark or somewhere around there. Um, but a very valuable, uh, lecture, I believe this week. Um, and I think it's going to, it's going to bring up a lot of kind of interesting topics for you all to discuss. Um, and maybe even email me about. So, uh, I look forward to that communication and uh, have a great week.